Well, people are coming in. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Cindy Rivera. I am the chair of the school counseling department here at New Canaan. Um, and we have a nice evening ahead of us. Bill, do you want to say hello before we get started? Sure thing. As always, I want to welcome everyone and uh, obviously thank our counselors and our honored guests for uh, doing this, this evening. Uh, as many of you know, I have a vested interest in this with a, a college, college, a high school junior. Um, so I am thrilled to, to watch and uh, learn along with all of you. So thanks for coming. And uh, once again, thank you to all of our, our panelists. I'm going to hide in the background. You'll see me leave, leave the screen, but I'll be here. Okay, Bill. Listen carefully. Okay, I'm going to share my screen so uh, people can can see our uh, our PowerPoint as we introduce. Well, I guess I'll start with introducing our panelists here. First of all, I'm going to ask each of you to um, just introduce yourselves and say a little bit um, about your schools. I also just wanted to introduce Linda McGann and Erica Shadler, two counselors who are helping me out tonight. Um, we are going to um, have questions, but we think you should wait to even add questions to the end because there's so much information that you'll be seeing tonight and hearing about. So there's, um, you might get your answer before you ever write it down. So, so hold on to the questions, we'll have time for that. Um, okay, so uh, Annie, do we wanna start with you? Definitely, good afternoon everybody, or good evening I should say. My name is Annie Wertha and I'm an Associate Director for the Undergraduate Admission Office at UCLA. I have been here for about 20 years now. And a little bit about UCLA, we are a large public institution. We received a record number of applications this last year, right under 150,000. Our admit rate for last year was approximately 11%. We don't have a final admit rate for this year. We offer a variety of majors, over 125 majors, or minors, and some unique programs available for our incoming freshmen. We also guarantee four years of on-campus housing for our incoming freshmen. So I'll share more at the end, but I'll turn it back over to Cindy. Okay, Susan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Susan McLarisi. I'm one of the associate directors in the admission office at Boston College. I've also been in the office for 20 plus years. Um, Boston College is located just a little bit outside of the city itself, or about six miles west of downtown. Um, we are a Catholic Jesuit university. We've got about 9,500 undergraduates who are spread across four undergraduate divisions, the largest being the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. And then we have three pre-professional schools, Carroll School of Management, Lynch School of Education and Human Development, and the Cannell School for Nursing. And uh, the big news for BC right now is that we just added an engineering major last year. So it's very exciting for all of us. Fantastic. Caitlin? Good evening, y'all. My name is Caitlin Provost, and I'm the Northeast Regional Director of Admission for Texas Christian University. I'm based full time in an office in Northampton, Massachusetts, and I work with all the students from the New England states in New York. I feel like the baby of the group because I've only been with TCU for 11 years. And that's a long time to me, but apparently not for this panel. Um, a little bit about TCU. We are a mid-sized liberal arts and sciences institution. Um, we've got about 10,000 undergraduate students, so that real, real sweet spot in terms of size. We have about 115 different majors, so a ton to choose from. I think the combination of the small classes and personalized attention, but still really big school spirit um, is something that's really, really unique about TCU. It's a place where you truly come down and just feel the community and collaborative spirit. So thanks for being here tonight. Fantastic. And Lauren, last but certainly not least. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Lauren Sefton. I'm Senior Associate Director of Admission at Rhodes College, a liberal arts and sciences school in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm originally from New Jersey, so I've worked with students from Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York for the last 19 years. Um, rounding out that, we've got some, some great experience here on this panel. I love it. Um, Rhodes College is a smaller liberal arts and sciences college. So we have just over 2000 students. We receive about 6,000 applications um, and we specialize in having that very broad based liberal arts and sciences education where regardless of your major, you'll take classes in a wide variety of subjects. Um, and we love students who come in undecided and want to explore. Although Rhodes students are probably most well known for the strength of our health professions advising and our business programs. What makes 
road so unique amongst liberal arts schools is the fact that we're in a major city. So for us, that small school, big city combination where you get the personalized attention of a classroom of about um, 12 students, but yet you have a city of 1.2 million people to go play in for internships and research and service opportunities um, creates a really, a really unusual dynamic and some great conversations on campus. So thanks for having us. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will will uh, work just fine. So There we go. So we just did that. Now we have everybody there. Thank you very much for that. So tonight, um, our objective is to really um, give you an inside look at what happens once um, a student's application hits uh, the committee stage um, when uh, their, their application has, has gone into the college and now a panel or people, it may be one, it may be two, it may be a panel, will look at an application and review all the pertinent data in, in order to help make a decision. So I think tonight will give you a really good idea of what a, a, an admissions committee looks like. Um, all the candidates that we're reviewing as well as the university is fictitious. Um, but, and so the committee for reviewing the candidates will act like they are part of our, uh, our university, Plymouth Shores, as it's a university in Massachusetts. Um, but at the end, then we will try to also go back and really talk to, about how each of them might have reviewed these candidates differently from their own point of view um, as we go through this. All right, so as we go through, they're gonna review it and, and really talk us through what's important to note on an application. We're going to start with uh, what we hear a term often called uh, uh, that's uh, a whole, what's called a holistic review. Many universities say this is what they do. So I'm going to start with um, Lauren and Caitlin and have them really talk about what is a holistic re review and how do you, uh, what factors do you consider when looking at that? Or at least the most important ones. And we know that all of these things have some level of importance to the application. I was going to say, yes, all of them are important. <laughs> I think um, when reviewing holistic applications, we're certainly looking at all of the individual aspects of an application. But um, in terms of my experience with review, I kind of look at it as a large pie chart. Um, and the academic section is going to be about at least 60% of that pie chart. Um, yes, we want students to come in and have a wonderful, well-rounded experience and be a great fit at our institutions. But the number one factor we need to consider is setting a student up for academic success. So we do need to make sure that they are going to come in you know, and perform well in the classroom and and be fulfilled by our education. So to me, I think I almost kind of combine GPA and curriculum just into a transcript. So the transcript is the number one thing that I'm looking at in my review. Um, how you do in courses, your grades, your grade trends. Did you stay steady? Did the grade trends go up? Did they go down? Um, also the strength of curriculum. Uh, we don't need to see students coming in with 27 AP classes because that would be just crazy. Um, but students who excel in certain areas, we want to see that they're challenged challenging themselves appropriately. And if a student is really strong in a certain area and they're not taking advanced coursework and it's offered, that kind of gives us pause. And we say, hey, you know, why is that the case? So really um, the trans transcripts is gonna be the number one thing. If this were a few years back, I would honestly probably say that test scores would be number two, but you know, in the space that so many colleges are in now, um, having gone either test optional or test blind, I don't think that weighs as heavily um, into review anymore, which is something that I think is great. Um, I think intended major is something that's often very big for schools. Uh, certain majors are just more competitive for admission than other majors at different institutions. I can tell you, for example, at a TCU, it's going to be business, pre-health and nursing are like our really most competitive programs. So I'm looking at the transcript and almost taking it up a notch for those individuals 
individual majors. Um, and then after that, it's really kind of a combination of all of the rest. So, you know, those letters of recommendations, the essays, um, I wouldn't even necessarily say demonstrated interest at this point, because I think that that's more of a piece of context at a lot of schools. Some schools work that, you know, that very differently, but for schools who do like a holistic review, like a TCU, that's going to be more of a point of context. So I would say, you know, the extracurriculars and all of that are kind of taken and put in together to make up the rest of the 40% of that pie chart. I agree. I agree very much with what Caitlin said about the academics being the core of a student's profile, because again, we're setting you up not just for success your first year at, in this case, Plymouth Shores University, but also um, all the way graduating four years later. And we do want you to graduate in four years. Um, one of the things um, that is important to know, if you are looking at liberal arts and sciences colleges, Intended major makes no difference in the application process because generally you are applying as an you are applying to the college and you won't actually declare your major till the second half of your second year. And so for some schools, it's not going to matter what your intended major is. We're interested in knowing it because it allows us to connect you with resources and opportunities and professors and students of like minded academic interests but it will have no bearing on the actual admission process, especially because we know that your mind might change once you once you get to college or you might have no idea what you wanna study and that's okay as well. Um, on top of that academic piece that Caitlin was talking about, we, we really are trying to figure out what kind of citizen are you? What does that engagement look like? And we know, especially over the last two years, that academics look different and engagement looks very, very different. And so um, something to keep in mind, all schools are reading applications through COVID grace, if you will, um, and trying to pay attention to how did you get involved with your community in what ways that you had available to you. And again, that looks different for everybody. It has always looked different for everybody. Some students are really engaged in a job and um, supporting family or taking care of friends and families and neighbors and others are involved in leadership or theater or student government. There is no golden magic key activity um, that that schools are necessarily looking for um, that we can provide for that. Again, that's that holistic review. Um, and then I will note for demonstrated interest, Rhodes was a school that that heavily factored demonstrated interest um, pre-pandemic. So I can I can be testimony that we want you to be invested in your own college search. And so whether or not a school actually factors that into their admission process, um, and most many are not doing that nearly as much um, given the circumstances of the pandemic, um, you should be thoughtful enough in your own college search that you have concrete reasons why you are applying to each school and why you would be a great fit for that institution and why that institution is a great fit for you. And then one of the other factors at the very end is financial aid. Some schools are need aware in their admission process. Other schools are not factoring financial need or a family's ability to pay for college at all into the decision-making process. So the answer for any holistic review process is we look at everything and it all depends. <laughs> I'm glad you cleared that up. So thank you. <laughs> So here we have uh, Plymouth Shores University and their mission statement. So I will allow everybody to read this. They can see this on their own, but perhaps um, Susan and Annie can talk to why it's even important that I have put this up as a slide. Susan, oh, Annie. I can go ahead and get started. So I think this goes in line with what Lauren was just talking about in terms of the fit. So it's gonna be really important for students to do their research and to have an understanding about what the mission, the goals of the particular institution they are choosing to apply to what that means. So in looking at Plymouth Shores at this fictional uh, university, some things that really stand out right away for me are that it's a research institution, that we're looking for students that are gonna be curious learners, for students that are gonna be critical thinkers, for students that wanna engage in research. So that would definitely be something that would stand out to me. And some Mission statements are gonna maybe offer a little bit more. Um, right here, we get a sampling of some of the majors that are gonna be available. So again, going back to, to understand what is important, what that, that, offer, that university offers to the students and how is it gonna benefit them themselves as well. Susan, is there anything else that you would add? Sure, I mean, I think that was perfect. The only thing I would add to is kind of the academic piece of this really plays into the mission at a lot of schools as well. And one of the things that I often say to students about at BC, and I think about a lot of liberal arts institutions is that we're very cross-disciplinary in nature. 
Um, and so I always, and when I'm looking at students and looking at their academic passions and their interests, I want to see that they're a student who connects to that. And, you know, with Plymouth Shores, that's the same thing. Um, seeing that their academic profile, both the courses that they've chosen to take, um, what their teachers have to say about them and how they engage with the classwork and their peers really lines up with the mission of the institution. Um, because generally speaking, most students who are applying to most of our schools are, you know, solid academic students, but it, it becomes more nuanced than just that you're a good student. It's how you connect with the kind of mission academically and culturally of the institution. And here Plymouth Shores mentioned some things about social justice. Um, that's a big thing at a Jesuit institution. That's a huge part of kind of our background at BC. I um, mean, that's certainly something that when I'm reviewing applications, I'm looking to see how students connect with the social justice aspect of their education and how they would kind of connect with it at BC, and in this case at Plymouth Shores. Good. And I think often many of you would have supplemental essays that sometimes um, connect to what your mission is and speak to that too. Okay, now let's go on to the profile of what Plymouth Shores looks like. Um, Perhaps Lauren, you want to start with this one and about why is, you know, why does this fit into a student? Why would a student be interested in this? So thinking about fit, we cannot review admission applications if we don't know who we work for, right? And so um, this gives us a sense of who, what does our community look like? Um, and you can see we have a, a nice medium-sized um, school with a focus on undergraduate education um, that's about as close to 50-50 as we can possibly get it. Um, about a third of our students describe themselves as multicultural, and we have a very residential campus. So you can imagine that engagement in our campus community is important. If you want to think about it, we're trying to figure out um, um, in our admission process, all the students that are going to sit around one giant dinner table, um, and if you could expand your our college cafeteria, our Plymouth Shores cafeteria to one giant dinner table, and we want to make sure that everybody has is bringing something to that table, and it's somebody that you're going to want to sit with and talk with and engage with and maybe disagree with and push push the boundaries a little bit in some of those conversations. And you can see that we have a, a fairly small student professor ratio, so we're looking for students that are going to engage with their professors um, as well. And I'll let Caitlin talk a little bit perhaps about athletics and, and following that um, motto. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that at least one of the applications we're gonna go through um, is really going to be interesting in terms of this athletic piece. As you can see, um, men's and women's lacrosse and track and field are division one. And so that is a completely separate process from the rest of the division three sports at this school. Um, once you start bringing in division one athletics, we're talking about you know the NCAA and you know full recruited student athletes and sort of what that means between admissions and athletics. So it's it's definitely a piece of context to keep in mind, um, you know, as we're, we're looking at all of these. I think aside from the profile, too, it's really important to note that, you know, every year for every college, there are certain institutional priorities um, that, that we are looking at. So, for example, perhaps Plymouth Shores started a new special education program this year, and they really want students to come in and fill that major. That's something that we're going to be, you know, keeping an eye on. Or perhaps every single bassoonist in the marching band, I don't even know if there's bassoons in the marching band, but, you know, isn't no longer with, the, you know, the school or graduated last year. Perhaps, you know, we're looking for students to join that marching band. So those are things to keep in mind too. And, and I also want to say that from year to year, institutional priorities can shift and they can change. So just because the school was looking for a certain thing one year doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they're looking for the next. So as you're going through, you know, your college lists and looking at all of that, just keep in mind that, you know, a student who was admitted with your profile last year may not necessarily be the student that is admitted this year too, because, you know, things do change from year to year. And I would echo Caitlin's comment about institutional priorities. Not only do they change from year to year, it's likely you will never actually know what those institutional priorities are. So you can focus on things like academic fit and things about bringing your best self to the admission process, um, but you're never going to know if there is a donor out there who is dying to have a left-handed, red-haired, 
tuba player in that marching band to make up for all of those bassoonists that are also um, leaving. And they've they've said, we'll fund a new building if you can find somebody to do that. That doesn't actually happen, but you would never know if it, if it was the case. And so um, don't try to read too much into guessing those institutional priorities or to try to like figure out your own search based on what an institution wants. You you be your best self and bring that to the table. I will say the tuba was a much better example for the marching band. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you for pointing that out because I knew we were going to get a question tomorrow as to how to how to know what the institutional needs are for each university. So uh, thank you. And then we have uh, the admission statistics of, of this very fine university um, as, and what's going on there. Uh, why would this be important? Maybe Susan and Annie can take this one as to why, why these stats are important to look at when, when kids are applying. I guess I'll go ahead and get us started. And probably one of the things that students should be looking at as they're um, determining where they're going to be applying is there may be some schools that may be a reach that are highly selective institutions that have lower admit rates, um, and that's great. Um, there may also be, and we would encourage students to also start considering some that have, uh, that are more accessible, that have larger admit rates. So as they come up with their list, they can um, make sure that there's gonna be maybe their safety net schools also in place. For this particular, um, it looks like the rate is 36%, so there's a good number of students that are getting admitted. And we also have the admitted student profile for the GPAs and the SATs. Uh, one thing that I think we can probably all agree on is that the most frequently asked question we get when we are at, at fairs, doing presentations is, what is your average GPA and what is your average test scores? And it's good to note that information, but it's also important to go back to one of our original talking points that many of us do admissions holistically and so it's going to be more than just the gpa more than just test scores those are just two of many different factors that we consider and as students and families look at this information i always try to just really spell it out that while there were 50 percent of the students that fell within that range that were admitted to the university there was another 25 percent of students that had below a 3.49 um, that were also admitted so it's more than just the test scores um, but again, students do want to be looking closely to make sure that they have a wide range of um, institutions that they want to be considered for. Susan, do you want to talk maybe about the other two points? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, and I'll also kind of go back to the, the rounds um, because this school, Plymouth Shores, has early action and re regular decision. Um, really important to understand how schools are functioning in terms of their deadlines. Um, you know, there are school, schools that have both early decision rounds one and two. Um, there are schools that have early decision and early action, um, places that just have regular decision, places that are rolling decision. So it's really important to understand of the schools that you're applying to kind of how they run their process. And then to dig a little bit deeper as families, and I always say, you know, you should feel empowered to when you're visiting schools to ask people um, any question that you want to know an answer to, and it should never be an uncomfortable thing for us in the admission office to answer um, any important question for families. So things like accept rates, early decision versus regular decision, or early decision versus early action. Basically, is it easier to get in at one time or another? That is a totally legitimate question that you absolutely should feel empowered to ask um, when you are visiting schools, because it's important to know. Um, if, if there's an advantage to apply at one time versus another at a particular institution. And then some other things that for here, it looks like, you know, the fact that interviews are encouraged seems like that that may play into possibly the demonstration of interest piece that could happen at Plymouth Shores. It's not totally clear um, if they're utilizing that and if, but often interviews are a way um, that schools may see your interest if you, if the schools are interviewing. And then again, very important to know that that they are need aware, not need blind. 
Um, so need blind means that schools don't have any clue of what your family or the admission office doesn't have any clue what your family's financial situation is and it does not impact the review of the application and the decision of the application. Um, so that's need blind. PSU is need aware. So they do take into consideration a family's ability um, to pay or not be able to pay for um, the institution. And then the last piece about being test optional, um, and I think probably the most angst ridden part of this process lately, um, when I think most schools went to test optional during the beginning of the pandemic, literally people couldn't get to tests. Um, and so that just for kids who couldn't get to test, okay, fine, I didn't submit them. Now most students can get to tests and you're not sure whether or not you should submit. Um, so again, another question that I really hope students feel and families feel empowered to ask schools is kind of the statistics behind um, how test optional has gone for their institution. How many students chose to submit tests um, when they applied? How many of those ended up being admitted who had tests and didn't have tests? And then the enrolled group, how many of them have tests and how many didn't have tests? I think those are all legitimate and questions that you should absolutely feel comfortable asking schools because so, it helps inform you as you're deciding about where you want to apply. Perfect. I'm gonna come back to that later, not right now. <laughs> okay, so um, every admissions uh, or every college in admissions has some kind of a form that they use to, to take notes on, their, on each candidate. So this I'm just showing as an example of breaking down a student profile, the academic factors, and then the activities as different things that come into account and weigh differently for every school. So I don't think we really need to go into this at this point. We've talked a lot about that. Um, is that okay if I just move through that for everybody? Okay. Um, but there is a lot of important uh, factors, but I think everyone's touched on this to some degree at this point. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look through each of these three applicants and review the application. And I'm going to ask uh, my panel here to now be the committee and they're going to um, out loud review what they're seeing. And I'm going to be the scroller and they're going to tell me when to move on. And they're going to take note of what's important on each of these applications. You in the audience, I will be voting on who to uh, who to accept and who to deny of these three applicants. So, so pay attention and, and take your own notes to see what, what you might like to, to do. So um, we're gonna start at the top here with Dory and see how this works out for everybody. Hopefully it works. There we go. Okay, so we start with Dory Johnson. And I'll let you guys speak to this as we go through. Well, you'll notice that Dory is a, a female student from California, so other side of the, the country um, where English is spoken from home. Um, but interestingly, she's a dual citizen, both US and Australia. So it might provide a different perspective as well. Um, and might have a factor that might play a role in financial aid because still being a US citizen gives her access to federal financial aid um, and is generally not treated as an international student, even though she might have an international perspective. So here we start looking at sort of academic interests and future plans for the students. So we're seeing that Dory is interested in, you know, journalism, communications field. She'd like to be a reporter, you know, or a journalist. So something to keep in mind as we're looking through that. Also, you can see some honors and awards, um, you know, editor in chief of the yearbook um, and a columnist for the paper. So all that's interesting because we start to note that that uh, falls in line with her academic interests. Senior courses are listed there too. And just quick things that jump out to me, um, only one AP in the senior year. And then um, no, I mean, again, these are things that just, I think for my school and no foreign language. So that, that kind of jumped out to me. So a 31 composite ACT, which is within that mid 50%, high mid 50%. 
For the activities, uh, for me, one thing that stands out is that we're seeing that there is a lot of consistency with all of the activities that started in the ninth grade and continued off to the ninth through the 12th grade. So that's something that we like to see. Uh, we're also seeing some really good um, time commitment with many of these activities going on for 40 weeks out of the year and pretty much year round. The other thing that I would start to look at also would be um, evidence of leadership um, within some of these activities. So I do see that the student is the editor in chief for the school yearbook, which is wonderful. And then also they have a part time job now in the 10th grade year. So seeing some good involvement both within the school community and then with the part time job outside of that. I think one other important thing to note is for the mission statement of the school that's very involved in you know social justice and community service there is that piece um being a board member um you know with the bay area youth service league so that could be something that fits well Oh, the meat of the the meat of the application where we get to see that academic um, piece that Caitlin talked about being so critical and every single college or university is paying close attention to those transcripts and you can see um, she's got a mix of B's and C's at, at, in the beginning and then she has a bit of a turnaround junior year um, with no C's but has switched to more of an A, B student and has added a little bit more rigor. So she's got a few honors in 10th grade and then adds a one AP in junior year and um, has one AP and one honors in senior year. So uptrend in grades and a slight uptick in rigor as she progresses through high school. The journalism all four years is an interesting piece. Um, can you, sorry, Cindy, can you go back one quick um, this transcript gives us both a weighted and unweighted GPA, which um, helps us understand a bit more about her grades in the context of the rigor. Um, remember, we're reading applications from all over the country, all over the world, and we're always trying to place that student's rigor and GPA in the context of their high school, uh, because it's going to uh, 3.62 um, at this school might look very different than a 3.62 at a completely different school. For, for our community, that's about a 91 average, right? <laughs> we, we are on 100 base, so we don't always understand that. Okay, now we're getting to her personal essay. So I don't know if you panel got a chance to look at this ahead of time, but perhaps you could comment on what's, what sticks out here. I thought she had a lot of detail and, and voice in um, through the essay, so and she wants to be a writer, um, so that's helpful to kind of put that in the context. Um, it for me, it's a little formulaic with the different masks, though very prescient with the pandemic. Um, but I think in general, the writing it, it, I it really lends itself to somebody who wants to be a writer in the future. Generally with essays, we're looking to see, can you write well? Um, and then also, what is your personality shining through? What are we, what are we learning about you as a, as a human being? Um, and hopefully we're learning a, something about the student. Um, and she's certainly opening up and sharing a lot of information with us. But I agree, the format feels a little bit, a little bit gimmicky to me. You could tell that the student was looking for a unique hook here. And... It, it hits, but yeah, a little gimmicky. Yeah, I definitely agree with Caitlin. And I think oftentimes students think that they have to grab our attention, that they have to be super creative, but ultimately it's more about the content. We take our jobs of reviewing applications really seriously. And when we're reading, students have our attention. So it's more about the content and more about learning about who they are as individuals and what contributions they could ultimately make to each of our campuses. You'll note that she is applying regular decision. Remember, I think Susan shared a little bit more about application plans and she is not applying for financial aid. So upon the shores being a need aware university, that's something we would pay attention to perhaps. Not so much that it would supersede uh, the good academic fit. Also, also talked about yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. She does have a lot of contacts as well. She's she's done a bunch of things. 
Oh, yes. Four of them. Yep. So scrolling down to these writing supplements, and we didn't really touch on this necessarily in her essay, um, but you'll see that uh, she shares with us that she has been diagnosed with ADD. Um, and I will say that she mentioned that in her essay once or twice, and now it's mentioned here numerous times. And so while I, you know, I'm very supportive of students who are comfortable sort of speaking about this, I, I feel like it's almost a little bit much. It feels like a prevalent theme in her application, whereas I'm not sure that's necessary. Um, there is an additional you know, information section on the common application. And that's such a wonderful place to put that information, but I'm not sure if it needed to be brought in um, to almost every single piece of the application. Remember, you only have so much real estate in your application. And so you wanna maximize your opportunities to share information with an admission committee. And so Caitlin's right, the additional information section lets us know specifically when she was diagnosed, which was between ninth and 10th grade, which helps give, con give context to her transcript where she was diagnosed, she was working on that diagnosis, and then we see the increase in grades by junior year. So that, that piece is very helpful because it gives us a timeline and some specifics. Um, and then I think perhaps the writing supplement and mentioning it in the essay almost was a missed opportunity to share something new and different with us. With that said, I like the fact that it was clear that she put in time and thought and research into these supplement questions. You know, we as college admission professionals ask applicants these questions because we want to know that you're taking this process seriously and that you're very interested in our school. So the fact that she goes into extreme detail, um, I thought was really impressive. There's no way that why Plymouth Shores would be a cut and paste. She couldn't drop yeah. that into yeah. another school's <laughs> application. And you guys take note of that, I say, I would say, of being cut and pasted. The so secondary school report. This piece does let us know that there actually were 27 AP classes available. So lots of opportunities for advanced rigor. Mm -hmm. Also shows what they consider to be the rigor of her program being demanding, um, not the most demanding program available at the high school. And that the academic achievement was considered above average for the school. Well above average. Letters of rec. So this is from the counselor. This looks pretty standard to me <laughs> um, in, in terms of what we read. Um, certainly no red flag, so I think that's good. Um, the counselor also does you know, um, mention the ADD diagnosis here, but I have no problem with that because we see a lot of that in, in counselor recommendations. Um, seems to speak well of you know the effort put forth in the classroom and also her time outside of the classroom. Um, and they talk a lot about the real girls in the real world blog. And it sounds like that's like a really true passion, you know, for the student. Um, so I read this as a solid standard recommendation. Also, I would just throw out there that, um, you know, depending on how universities review applications, um, for some places they review by territory. So, you know, we know the high schools extraordinarily well, kind of know them by the back of their hands. Some places don't, or there may be a new staff, staff member in the admission office. So kind of the framing of North Point High School and explaining um, how the, what the high school's like and, and how the students kind of engage in that high school is very helpful in context to understanding what's happening beyond just looking at the GPA off the transcript. And the counselor admits to maybe not having as much opportunities to get to know the student that well because of the caseload. And that is perfectly understandable. The national average caseload is 452 students per one counselor. And so in this setting, we know that the fact that the counselor is even able to provide this much information and context about the student, I think is, is fairly impressive. Um, and that we'll also dig a little bit more deeper into teacher recommendations because those those are school professionals that have had more interactions with Dory than the counselor has been able to do. And we don't hold that against 
the applicant at all. And then we have the teacher rec. For me, this is one of those teacher recs that, and we see a lot of these where um, the student has definitely shown growth and um, has kind of gone from one space uh, academically and, and really has gone to another one. And that's helpful to see that somebody can move from, you know, some C's and things uh, onto a, a different level of academic. And so that's really what this particular teacher rec, I think, highlights um, and is helpful in understanding academically who this student is. Okay. Now we're seeing that Dory did take advantage of doing that interview, um, which was recommended for Plymouth Shores. Um, it sounds like, you know, so far she's been one of my favorites, which I think you know, is all very positive. Um, yeah, and, and looking through, it sounds like it was just like a wonderful conversation and they were fully engaged, you know, for the hour and her interviewer does know um, her passion for helping others. So again, that all comes back to the, the mission of Plymouth Shores. And this is a nice piece of demonstrated interest. She reached out to her counselor. So some schools track that, some schools do not. And just in case she wanted to let you know, in case you didn't know, she has been diagnosed with ADD. Yep, that too. <laughs> okay, good. We're gonna go to our next applicant. So uh, as you could see, that took a little bit of time to, to really review that. So I appreciate all the comments so far. So now we're talking about Henry. Okay. So Henry is coming to us from California. Um, this is a student from an underrepresented background who speaks two languages. So that's something to note because a lot of student or a lot of schools will know if a student um, has another first language. Um, can keep scrolling here. Very good. A lot of times schools will know if a student is first generation mm -hmm. college, they're the first in their family to attend college or their parents, or if their parents, both parents went to college, just trying to get a, again, put the student's uh, academic journey into context. In Henry's case, both parents went to college. What's standing out for him right here, um, and we'll likely see this later on in the transcript, but we do see that the student was dual enrolled. So it looks like he went to, UC Irvine and took uh, some courses there. So it's great when we see students really going beyond the curricular opportunities available to them at their school and either taking maybe courses over the summer at their local community college or another institution. Um, and these are pretty significant courses, multivariable calculus, introduction to linear algebra and so forth. So really great um, academic um, rigor of those courses that the student has taken. And the interest in robotics, all of this is starting to coalesce with his STEM interests as well. Yeah, we see that the major was computer engineering. So definitely um, probably most, if not all programs for, for schools of engineering or engineering majors are going to be looking for that strength in mathematics and science as well if it extends beyond the classroom into the activities. Here we're looking at some testing, you know, for a student who's heavily involved with STEM. I think uh, those fives on those AP exams are, are pretty impressive. Um, and one time he took the SAT um, and that score is impressive as well and fits in well with the Plymouth Shores profile. And clearly math is a, a strength yeah. with three 800s. <laughs> We're seeing those same same veins coming through in his activities with leadership in both um, the computer club and the robotics club, um, and did a did an internship as well in a similar field. With that said, I have to say I find this resume um, <clears throat> a touch lacking in some ways. While I do really like the fact that he is involved in things that he's passionate about and clearly talented in. Um, 
uh, where is the earlier involvement throughout high school? Where is that, you know, commitment? Where is that community service? To me, I don't think that aligns as well, maybe with some of the things that Plymouth Shores is looking for. Definitely. And I'll say that maybe even uh, for some of the students and the parents in the audience that uh, we have seen a little bit of a shift with the pandemic and in involvement and in limited opportunities. However, it has not been as significantly decrease students' involvement even during this time. So we continue to see ongoing consistency in the students' involvement. In terms of the transcript, you clearly, again, see where there are strengths in science and math, um, but not strengths in English and history and, and kind of more the social sciences. So going back to Plymouth Shore and its mission, um, it, it is more of a liberal arts institution. And while it does have you know, majors in business and engineering, they still, one of the things they focus on is you know, strength across disciplines. So interesting to see how he'll fit academically um, with the institution itself. Yeah, and just to go off that too, I think that at these liberal arts schools, yes, you end up choosing a major and he's obviously very interested in STEM and could graduate with that major. Um, but one of the core things that you know we look for is when students come into these liberal arts and science schools, they do take courses across all sorts of different disciplines because no matter what your major ends up being, we want you to be able to leave our school, Plymouth Shores, um, being able to think critically and communicate effectively in the outside world across an array of subjects. I want you to be a very well-rounded individual. In his essay, one of the things that struck me when I was taking notes was this app that he developed um, for his grandmother that ends up helping or that he wants to help other Alzheimer's patients with um, is very, very interesting and unique and definitely stood out. Um, and it's a great spot to talk about it in his essay. Also could have been put in the resume area. Um, that was another spot where that could have gone. Uh, but this was a really unique um, essay because he had done something a bit different that he was highlighting. Yeah. And it shared some insight into his personality and that there is uh, a heart for, for service that maybe wouldn't have come through in just looking at his resume. All right, we see another regular decision application. Um, because Plymouth Shorts is need aware, we all are also taking note that he will not be applying for financial aid. Both of the students though, were looking for merit scholarships. Yeah. So. And we can see some engagement with a campus tour and a college fair as well. So he's been on campus. Well, here's the interesting one. <laughs> we have a school discipline situation. Um, I'd be very curious to hear, you know, the thoughts of my fellow committee members on this one, because I am of two minds personally. Um, first of all, this, you know, issue happens right in the beginning of Henry's high school career back in ninth grade. And I think we are all aware that everybody makes mistakes and it sounds like this is one of them. Um, you know, he certainly explained the situation. I have to say that to me, the explanation comes off as a bit something. Um, the fact that he said, I plagiarized sort of, that's not really taking ownership of that. And at the end, it's talking about how he was embarrassed by it. Um, are you embarrassed or are you truly remorseful? I can't really tell from this response. So I'm not saying that this is the end all be all for me with this application, but it's certainly something that I'm going to keep in mind because I just don't know from this if he's taking full responsibility for his actions. Totally agree. The sort of doesn't sit super well. Agree as well. I am, um, I think it's to Henry's benefit that this happened in ninth grade. So he's able to show growth or at least indicate that there's not a trend or a track record of um, 
academic dishonesty. And we'll see later in the council recommendation that the counselor su supports the, um, the explanation and indicates that there that this is the only time that Henry's work has been in question. So I, I at least feel confident moving forward that, the, that a lesson was learned, whether it was truly remorseful and taken to heart, maybe we could have worked on this explanation a little bit longer. Annie, you good with that? <laughs> yes, definitely. Teachable moment for the student probably could have done better in explaining it and taking uh, ownership. Okay. I appreciated the why Plymouth Shores response because again, it was clearly not something just copied and pasted and that it gives some specific um, meaning behind how Plymouth Shores ended up on Henry's list. Um, but I, I, we talked a little bit about maximizing your real estate and I think we're seeing some <laughs> themes over and over again on this one too. I thought this top five list was really interesting. Part of me is like, oh wow, like this student is just so into the STEM field and so into you know the inventing and the innovating, but part of me also kind of wishes there had been something else a little bit more well-rounded on the list, because again, this is a liberal arts and sciences institution and it's all about having a well-rounded experience. And I feel like he's just so laser focused. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that's just a piece that I picked up on. I would say he does tie it in pretty well to their explore, dream, yeah. discover. I thought he did yeah. a good job with that. And I, I don't want our audience to be thinking we don't want students that have a strong interest and embrace that interest. We're looking for a well-rounded class. Everybody, every applicant in that class does not necessarily have to be well-rounded. Lots of points go into making the spokes of a wheel and create that well-rounded class. So. Um, just to just to say we we are looking looking at both aspects but I would throw out there for this student you know there is the thought is this student particularly better served at a university that is technically minded right so that that's another question too you know are you better at an RIT or you know whatever that would be in the fake world um, <laughs> that, that that's kind of the question that, that I would have definitely agree And here we're learning about the school, what's offered. Just I thought the note. descriptors yeah. were hilarious. Sorry. Yeah. No, I would say just just kind of an, you know, schools do know the how many students attend four year colleges and how many attend two year colleges. That is something that we do pay attention to too. Gives you some background about what, what's happening in that particular school. And it looks like the curriculum here is considered very demanding and the academic achievement is outstanding. So in the top 5% of students. It also is interesting to note that the extracurricular accomplishments have a much lower rating. The council letter. I would say very detailed, um, you know, again, gives a lot of insight into both academic and extracurricular experiences. And I would say that with recommendations just in general, they flesh out the rest of the application. Like it's, it's fine to see kind of all of the grades and all of the resume, but it, this gives you the narrative for it and helps you kind of place the student and place it all together. So that's what this for me does. And to address actually a question I saw in the chat, um, they're asking how many recommendations do colleges require? Truth be told, it completely depends. Um, every school has a different policy on that. I'd say it's pretty standard to require one from a counselor and one from a teacher, um, but some will take two teachers and not a counselor or some require extra teachers or some will not accept letters of recommendation at all. So that's another really great question um, as you're looking into each individual school and kind of their application checklist um, to take note of that.
So we, we would have been really surprised if we had not gotten a math recommendation letter for this student. So, so this, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> And it's very nice. I think this teacher clearly has very strong high feelings for Henry. Another student who took advantage of that suggested interview and sounds like it went very well um, and that he was honest about his disciplinary issue with the interviewer, which is interesting. And the interviewer is the associate dean of admission. It, I think the last interviewer was an alum. Um, and I do believe, at least in my notes, that somewhere doesn't seem to be concerned about the fact there was a plagiarism issue. Um, so I think that's a good factor to know for the committee that the associate dean of admission doesn't feel that that was a, a, a huge red flag for the student. It does sound like this interviewer too did kind of notice um, Henry's interest in, in more STEM classes and did ask about the fact that, hey, are you gonna be okay taking other classes here? And it sounds like they had a nice chat about that. And also addresses exactly what Susan was talking about, about are you not considering a math science focused university in this case, like Caltech, where his dad went. Um, and. So the, the nice thing about having this interview is it's helping to provide the student perspective on all the same questions that we had reading the file. Good. That's the end of that one. Okay, everybody take their notes and then we're gonna have a final one with Mar Marcella. Marcella. Noting a couple of the same things that we did in the last application, um, that both English and Spanish are a first language for the student and does come from an underrepresented background. At first glance, seems like she has a very strong senior year. So I'm excited to see what her whole transcript looks like. A good sense of a very strong senior year. We see public health interest, wanting to be an advocate. So that's something that fits well with Plymouth Shores. Can we go quickly back to the involvement I, or maybe, no, I'm sorry, you can keep going. There was just the honors and awards. I thought we had. So even though Plymouth Shores is test optional, we've got test scores for all three applicants. And you can see we've super scored test scores here as well. Um, the 29 falls on the low end of our mid 50% range. Um, and then I think her SAT composite falls within the mid 50% yeah. range. And you see a lot of heart for service here. Um, with sustained commitment with the Susan G. Komen walk. Um, and then also in addition to service, you get the balance of um, leadership and athletics uh, as well and leadership with the education club. Coupled with balancing a job, but only one week. I can't. I would have liked to have seen a touch more service for what it's worth. Um, that was only it looked like from that a commitment that was a few weeks a year, but it is there. And I think we, we learn more about that involvement yeah. and engagement later on in the application. So again, maybe a missed opportunity here to explain it where if we're quickly reading through, we might kind of gloss over it. Um, and that's a missed opportunity for making an impact. What really stands out here is just the 10th grade performance. And when I see something like this, I would hope that as I go through the file, uh, letter recommendations and so forth, that I'm there's some insight into why there was a drop um, from just one C, mostly A's and B's in ninth grade to quite a few C's 
Now they are bouncing back and um, given that they have a very rigorous program, it would be interesting to see what was going on back then if there is any explanation to be given. And you do see she is taking, uh, again, her most rigorous year was senior year. Um, and I think we, we did have mid-year grades. Uh, yeah. yeah. That she's okay. actually, her best year so far is her most rigorous year. If I'm being honest, and I don't know the policies of the school, but I'm almost surprised she was able slash qualified to take so many AP classes um, with maybe not the strongest grade trends previously. This essay could be an indicator of why sophomore year, the grades were a little difficult because of the death of an aunt um, that happened in sophomore year. And I thought very well written, um, very authentic and honest and open. So this is another regular decision application. And we do note here under the need aware policy um, that Marcella is applying for financial aid and merit scholarships. And the aunt who passed away went to Plymouth Shores. In comparison, perhaps to some of the other, why is you know Plymouth Shores a good fit for you? Um, I wasn't quite as impressed here. Um, you know, it talks a lot about you know her aunt attending and you know all of that, but I I don't really see why she is saying it's gonna be such a great fit for her. This five top five list did speak well to the, the kind of the mission of social, mm -hmm. uh, social engagement um, and social justice that Plymouth Shores has talked about. So with 12 AP classes offered at the school, it's, she certainly, especially in senior year, took advantage of that coursework. Intriguingly though, the counselor says demanding program. It's not the top program that they would offer. And we know that students are not allowed to take more than three AP classes without special circumstances. And she is taking four her senior year. So echoing Caitlin's thought on interesting that she was able to take not just the max the above maximum but also that she was able to get into those so i think this counselor recommendation letter is critical to understanding a lot of marcella's transcript when you read the circumstances in the second and third paragraphs, you have a much greater understanding of the role she had to play with family responsibility um, and have more of a, an idea of the background, the fact that she was balancing full-time responsibilities and taking care of, of, of a household while juggling academics and frankly, her aunt passing away. This is a nice letter of recommendation. It's not an absolute standout to me, but it's nice. Ah, here is the interesting one here. So it appears that the track coach at Plymouth Shores is interested in this student um, joining the team. However, um, it's been a fantastic year for them for recruiting. So all of their technical recruited athlete spots through the NCAA have already been taken. Um, so this 
really wouldn't be a recruited athlete situation coming forth. Um, I think it would really depend on Plymouth Shores, you know, stance on preferred walk-ons and, you know, things like that. But it, it, I think this would be a whole different kettle of fish if this student was a technical recruited NCAA athlete. Yeah, it seems from what we're getting from here that the coach is like, oh, we'd love to have her if you admit her, um, but they're not putting any of their kind of um, eggs in, in her basket at all. Yeah. Um, so she's really not recruited. So had she been a recruit where the, the, the coach was putting in saying, I want this student, then what happens then? It depends on the school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we don't, we kind of don't know Plymouth Shores policies on any of that. Um, okay. And there's a bunch of us who work at division one schools. So. Yeah. Okay. Just thought I'd throw it out there. Just <laughs> From a division three standpoint, it's nice to know, but it's not going to overshadow everything else in the student's application. Okay. Well, perfect. Now. I am going to, ah, where were we? Okay, so we, we just heard a lot, but wait, I wanna get back to this. So we did hear a lot um, from everything that came that we talked about, and I really appreciate how you read those. So that, that was fantastic. so much information. So here we're kind of summarizing the three candidates to kind of uh, do a quick review of, of these before we ask everyone to vote. So in each case, there was something that might have dinged them a little bit. And then there was, you know, quite the comparison in terms of GPA and everything else with them. I kind of want to give this as a summary to all our our audience here, because the next thing we're going to do is ask people to vote and then we'll ask you all to talk about what you think um, as we go forward with this. So I'm going to stop sharing and- um, And I am hopefully gonna start. You're gonna start sharing yeah. uh, so that you can paste the link into the, Erica, into the chat. Yeah. Is that what you're going to do? It is just sent out to everybody in the chat. So hopefully everybody has access to that link now. I'm going to quickly share my screen with you all, and hopefully we are going to be able to watch your votes come in. That's the plan. Okay. Hopefully it's going to work. So I'm going to scroll down here. It's going to be a little jumpy as people are voting, so I'm trying to keep it as steady as possible, but bear with me. My goodness, now <laughs> I'm <it's> jumping. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about the screen. I can't seem to make it stay still, but. Are you doing the scrolling? I'm scrolling to try to make okay. it so that you guys can see it. But unfortunately, when a new vote comes in, it brings us back to the top. <laughs> okay, we'll give everybody a minute here. We still have a hundred people in this room. So hopefully people will. Uh... We'll play with this for a couple a minute or so and we'll see where where we came out on this so we're voting for one to admit one to deny and then assume that the other one will be waitlisted oh is that clear almost 50 responses oh there we go 50 <laughs> responses good what we all love about this is seeing that there are wonderful attributes that all three applicants would bring to any college community. Um, it's fun to think about the possibilities. So it's kind of stopped at this point. So we have, uh, oops, before. So it looks like Dory is slightly ahead of the game here for admits. And am I looking at this right? 
we keep changing it. Is that by <laughs> one? Or it kind of evenly it's split fine. between Dory right now, and Marcella? <laughs> Poor Henry is getting the uh, bulk of the Henry's deny. Denied. I will say, Henry is. <laughs> Poor Henry's Henry. deny. <laughs> Okay, that's 62 responses. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you everybody for doing that. So I'm going to now ask the admissions committee to um, tell us what they're thinking. Do you want us just to vote? Um, yes, I'm not giving you a link to vote. I just want you to talk to me about what each of you would have voted for an admit. Um, I, I personally would have voted for Dory. Okay. Yeah, same goes with me. Given the rigor of her program, her involvement, consistency, there's a lot of things that really stand out and make her a well-rounded applicant um, in my eyes. So I would vote to admit Dory as well. I, like the group, was waffling between Dory and Marcella of these three applicants. I really do think Marcella's, the responsibilities that she took at home, the empathy that she showed, the leadership with the breast cancer walk, I, I think she speaks well to the mission of Plymouth Shores. I think she adds um, some multicultural diversity that we are also looking for in our, in our community as well. Um, and I liked that she's taking on that rigor senior year, whereas Dory really kind of backed off on that rigor, had the least rigor amount of rigor. And I feel like, especially in our test optional world now, I, I think we're focusing more on rigor than, than frankly ever before, for where students are showing that um, interest and strength. Yeah, I'll agree with you know, everything said so far, I think at the end of the day, I would probably vote to admit Dory um, just because I thought her program was interesting and her involvement tied in so well. I have to say, poor Henry is getting, you know, the short end of the stick here because yes, there's some things in every application, you know, that, that stick out to you that may not be as positive as some others, but what a fascinating young student. I mean, I'm just super impressed and he, he was even up there for me. I'm honestly surprised that so many people disliked him so much. I mean, our math and our computer science faculty at Plymouth Shores are banging the, down the doors for somebody like Henry. I was surprised by that as well, so. <laughs> and then who would you have voted to deny? I think for me, I guess if, if we had two, the the one that doesn't get denied gets waitlisted. Marcella would have been the waitlist for me for all the things that have already been mentioned. Um, and I will note that I think Lawrence uh, mentioned her senior year. Senior year is so critical. Um, we were looking for a strong senior year. It's going to be the last year that's going to prepare students for college level work at any one of our institutions. So that was very impressive. Um, so I would probably say for me, Henry uh, would be a denied, but I think this goes to point that the decisions that we have to make are so challenging and so difficult. And here you have a student that's done great and the rigor, the, the courses he's taken and the involvement in building the app, but yet this is how it is in the real life that we're turning away some really outstanding candidates in, in some instances. So I would say for me, I would, um, deny Henry and waitlist Marcella. I would agree with that completely for all of the exact reasons that you said. <laughs> so I'm gonna go out on a limb here and disagree. Um, and I, I will mention a couple of realistic factors. Yes, it is a holistic application review process. And yes, there were some incredibly compelling parts of Marcella's application. And for what it's worth, I wouldn't actually deny her. I would just wait list both of them. Um, <laughs> that we, we have the option to do that. Um, but if we had to deny one, I, I would choose 
to Danai and Marcella because while I do think she would be a wonderful advocate on campus, I do feel like the other applicants maybe put some more time and effort um, into their application and into Plymouth Shores, into those supplement responses, into those interviews. Um, truth be told, you know, some of her academic numbers too are not improving the academic profile of the school. And that coupled with the fact that this is a need aware institution. I don't read for a need aware institution. So I'm not used to looking at it through that lens, but I'm trying to keep that in mind right now. And realistically speaking, I think if we're if we're not admitting Henry in this circumstance, Henry makes a, a strong waitlist candidate. Um, once a school is looking at the waitlist, they're looking for what holes they might need to fill. They're watching the deposits come in and seeing, okay, we've got that, remember that dinner table um, of, of that class of students. And then where are we looking to, to fill some holes? Where are students not responding to our offer of admission that we, we hoped they would? And in a lot of cases that could be because Plymouth Shores is need aware, somebody who doesn't need financial aid. Um, like Henry, it could be somebody for increasing our multicultural diversity. Henry offered that as well. Um, I think we were slightly more female than male. Henry might fill that hole. So there are some some boxes to be checked on a waitlist process. Again, that have nothing to do with individual applications and everything to do with institutional priorities and making and meeting a class um, that Henry might offer some opportunity there. All very good points. And it just goes to show, I mean, how complicated this can be. And then you do it thousands of times in a season. Um, I just know when I was reading this, by the time I got to the third one, I'm, I'm kind of zoning out. So I, I'm sure that happens for you too. At a certain point, you're tired and uh, you have to put it away and start all over again the next day. The good news though, is that all the applications go through multiple reads. There are different sets of eyes on a file. So even if I'm tired or cranky or I didn't have my coffee this morning, Caitlin did and she'll be looking at the file next. Or um, Susan can go in committee and be like, hang on, let's take a closer look at this, at this student. So there can be opportunities to balance, uh, balance some of that out. I just wanna jump in and say, depends on mm. how every school does this. We do not do that at BC at all. Um, we are single reader. I've yeah. had my schools for 20 plus years. I've had New Canaan forever. Um, and I don't personally get, um, I, I just adore what we do and I adore everybody's stories and, and that you kind of have to be built to do that. Um, so I was that kind of kid in high school and I kind of liked all that kind of work. Um, but I, I, the point of all of that is that every school does this differently. And again, empower yourselves and ask, how do you make decisions at your institution? Is it committee? Does it go on to a second reader? How does it work at the institution? Public schools work totally different, you know, things like that. Um, so really, that's part of the research part that I think is really helpful to families as they're visiting schools is to find out how people make the decisions that they do. So as institutions, before we move on to questions, how would, would each of your institutions read these students very differently than how you were commenting tonight? Um, because each of you made great comments about each candidate. So were there certain factors that wouldn't have come into play for you? Obviously the, the scores for most of you and things like that, but otherwise would there have been a different read from your own standpoint? I'll say that I, I may be the one outlier here on the panel tonight that it would have been a very different read for us at UCLA um, because there are certain things that we just don't have access to. So we do not review letters of recommendations. We do not consider demonstrated interest. We are um, meet blind, so we don't take into consideration whether somebody can or can't afford uh, UCLA or will be applying for financial aid. Uh, we also don't have early decision and early action. Um, so essentially every single application is reviewed at least twice in its entirety, and there are some additional reviews for students that are along the borderline, for students that appear to have high GPAs but are going to be denied or low GPAs and are about to be denied. So there's quite a few quality control uh, reviews, but we still do look very carefully at GPA, the curriculum, the rigor, the context of the school, um, how students have chosen to take advantage of those opportunities, the involvement, the leadership, 
and, and we do have four personal insight question responses that students respond to. So we're really looking for them to advocate for themselves. Whereas maybe with other schools that allow for letters of recommendations, the counselors, the teachers are able to do that. In our process, it would be the student letting us know any additional information that maybe that person would have shared on their behalf. So definitely uh, slightly different for us. Uh, we also do look at um, student and family demographics, first generation, low income, um, we have other factors uh, that we consider uh, in terms of the school environment. So just to give you a sense, it would have been, we would not have, have had access to all of this at UCLA, all this information. Thank you. Okay. I was just going to say for BC, while we would have, we actually require two teacher recs and a guidance counselor rec, and, and that is a big part of our review process. Um, we are need blind as well. And we do not look at demonstration of interest. So that wouldn't have been a factor at all. And I, just me being me as the single reader, the transcripts were driving me crazy. Um, I just academically, nobody for me felt good. <laughs> so. so I would kind of agree there. We are need blind. So I would not be looking at any of that information there. Um, we do a lot of focus on that transcript with you know, like I was mentioning earlier in the program, you know, grades and grade trends and strength of curriculum and where we recalculate every single GPA into an unweighted academic only scale. So I would be spending a lot of time there. And I have to say, all three of the applicants, I, I do question the academic fit for my own university. Um, but a lot of the other parts of the review in terms of looking for students who are involved in leadership and service and social justice, that would have been um, a very similar review to what we'd be doing at TCU. And Rhodes has the smallest applicant pool of this panel. We get about 6,000 students. Um, we're also the smallest school of just 2,000 students. And so um, being, we are, we are selectively test, we are test optional, but we are also test blind at a benchmark level. So for a student who has either a 28 or higher or 1300 or higher test score, we just know that they submitted test scores and they breached that benchmark, but we don't actually know what those are. So for example, Henry, who was really hanging his hat on some high test scores um, in some ways, we wouldn't have even noticed that necessarily um, because we are spending so much more time on the transcript and the rigor of the curriculum and the grade trends. Now, Henry at least took advanced level rigor um, in a way that some of the other applicants did not um, in the areas that they were they were strong in. But we do partner reading. So every application is read the very first time at least by two people. And it goes through at least two reads, but honestly, many times three reads. So um, we do spend a lot of time honing in on that. Um, we have historically looked at demonstrated interest and um, we aren't looking at it now with the pandemic. Um, however, because we work so closely with our students, it's always better when I pick up your application and I go, oh, that's right. I remember meeting Marcella at that coffee shop. Um, that was so fun. She had such a great conversation. And then I'm thinking individually about that student because um, we are in a position where we can really build those relationships and connect you very early on. Um, but not every school is going to have the luxury of being able to, to spend that amount of time. Great. Great. Okay, let's get to some of um, our questions uh, that have been coming up. Does anyone, uh, Linda, are you sure. doing those and seeing what sure. we got? There's a couple questions and while we'll wait for uh, any, anybody else to put them in the Q&A, um, there is a question about uh, demographics with parents, educations and jobs. Uh, we noticed in the review that you did note some things about citizenship and um, where in the country they live. How important is it um, to note uh, a parent's education and jobs and what do you do with that information? So the common application has left that let that be a lot more optional as to whether of how how much detail you want to share. I think for some, it's it's interesting. Um, is it going to factor in with an admission decision? No, but if a student is first generation college, I think that's something that we are all paying attention to in many different ways. Um, so if students are coming from different different backgrounds and perspectives, just like if you have a family that, uh, where a second language is spoken in your home or English is not the first language spoken at home. Again, it just adds a different dimension to the application. Um, okay. 
Thank you. That, that um, for the UC application, it is optional to list uh, the parents' level of education, their income, and so forth. But it's information that if it, it is presented and it's visible to us, it can only help a student and give us more context. It would never hurt a student for us to see that there is high income, that a parent might have a postgraduate degree, and so forth. So it won't be used to negatively impact a student. Um, is what I really want to make sure I get across. But it is optional at the end of the day. And just uh, for people, if they're concerned about showing that they're legacy, children of alumni, that kind of thing, there are other spots in the application where you can do that too, okay. in the Common App. Right, okay. Um, in view of what parents deem um, the competitive nature of uh, the application process, uh, one of our um, attendees would like to know about paid college counselors, how they fit into this process, if at all, on your end. I find them incredibly easy to spot. Yep. Um, having done this forever, and I, Annie and everybody else probably can spot it too. Um, and it, you lose voice, you lose authentic voice if you rely too heavily on somebody massaging and taking care of your application. 45-year-olds um, sound different than 18-year-olds. And it, I, what's the point? I, I this is your process and I wanna hear you. Um, and I would also throw out, just again, having worked with New Canaan for two plus decades now, um, that you have excellent college counselors right there in your school who write beautiful recommendations for you, know you really well. And I, I don't see the advantage um, to doing spending a significant amount of money in that realm. Um, for some people, you know, maybe there are specific things that are happening in your family or with your particular student and their and with their learning or their years of of high school and it may suit you to be with somebody who um, can help you kind of navigate this process in a very specific way. Um, but I think thinking of it as like some sort of advantage um, strategically to get into a certain caliber of school um, is probably not accurate about what really happens in this process. I would have to agree with Susan on all of her points in all honesty um it is really easy to spot um there <laughs> there must be like one main independent consultant group in southern connecticut because all of the applicants that i work from with these schools send me the same exact introductory email in the same exact format and i mean every time it just cracks me up because like thank you for reaching out and showing me your interest but i know that this was scripted. Um, so take things like that into consideration. Um, the fact that really at this point, only adults, like much older adults, put two spaces after every period. So when we go through and read a student's application and we see that, it's kind of a, hmm, that's a, that's a tip off right there. Um, I do think in some cases that independent consultants um, are wonderful for special circumstances if students have those or when students are at a school um, where they don't have access to the great counseling that Susan was mentioning. But at New Canaan, that's not something that you're gonna have to worry about. Thank you for your insight. Um, we have a question about activities. If a student has been really involved in an activity for four years, but doesn't hold an actual leadership role, how would that play in the process? That activity section is yours to share in as much detail as you wish. Um, you can only list 10 activities, but um, you're able to go into detail. Even if you don't have a leadership title, you can still share some of the responsibilities. And we get to see the engaged, um, sustained commitment that you've had over time as well. And that can be equally important. I think some of us, we've all been there where we've been in clubs or activities or group projects where the person with the title is not necessarily doing the heavy lifting. So we can all relate and you can share that information um, in that additional line about the activities. While we're talking about that activities list, also make sure you explain not just what you're doing or how you're engaged, but what that activity 
or club is. If you use an acronym, we may know what it means, especially if we've been reading your, your applications, your schools for 20 years, but we may also not remember what whatever string of alphabet letters you want to put together means. So make sure you share actually what you're doing. We are looking at you slobs, right? <laughs> that was just, yeah. Erica, we have someone who would like to see the parent audience vote one more time. Is that possible to bring that up? Yes, bear with me here. With the um, final results. Maybe, let's see, yes. So in any of these, while you're looking at that, can a strong essay make up for a weak academics? or vice versa, a weak, a, a, a weak essay, oh, can that overshot, overshadow those solid academics? I, I think Caitlin said it best at the beginning that academics are the core to your application. If you're not going to be successful academically at our institution, then the, a fabulous essay is not necessarily going to overcome that academic preparation. It will not overcome that academic preparation. For sure. But I, I, I do think that this has gotten more and more and more nuanced, I, at least in my applicant group. Um, you know, I, I'm making decisions that are razor thin at this point. And so, yeah, sometimes, you know, I'm not saying a bad academic program, you know, like a really, really solid academic program. Everybody's academic program is really up there. That writing can definitely um, do something. So I, I would say it's not like something's going to overtake something else, but anything that is, a, is going to add to your application to enhance um, that academic ability, and that includes writing, um, definitely can help your application. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, and you, you spoke to this about growth in academics. Someone wants to know, do you consider positive trends in academic performance? And I know we did um, touch upon that a bit um, in one of the applicants. Um, that is something that you consider um, when you're looking at an application? Yeah, I'd certainly rather see a trend up than a trend down. Yes, yes. <laughs> And anytime there is a decrease, like we saw in Marcellus application, what we love to see next is an explanation of what may have contributed to that decline in performance. And then also that there has been a bounce back from whatever might have happened, that the student has responded now in a positive manner, but definitely looking at trends very closely. Okay. And we have one more question here, and um, it's interesting. Uh, it's a parent who says that this uh, panel has made them uh, a bit nervous because they have a student who's who's basically a very um, you know fine academic student, high Bs, low As, involved in a couple of things, has some nice friends, is respectful, and um, they're concerned that that student might fall through the crack. And uh, just your you know some final thoughts on what you, uh, how you perceive that. I think the most important thing is building your list. That is the key thing in this entire process. Um, and that means working with your counselors, listening to yourself and building a list that every single school on there you like. I I'm not a believer anymore in safety. Um, I just don't, I, I don't think that's the way to think about this. Uh, this process should be about finding their, and I always say there's more than 30 schools out there. Um, you know, there's so many colleges and universities in the United States, and there are so many that can be good fits for you. Um, but it is about building that list that you like every single one on there, and you could go there and be thrive and really be happy. That's crucial. Um, so if you kind of fall into the world where you're going to do what everybody else has done or, or kind of and there's lots of pressure to do that, you know, especially in this pandemic. Um, then, yeah, it can start to feel very scary and angst-ridden. But I think if you can go into this process and really trust yourself um, and kind of get rid of all the chatter and do what's right for you and build that list that you really enjoy, you're going to be absolutely fine. Rhodes is a member of a consortium called the Colleges That Change Lives that was 
originally focused for liberal arts colleges that focus on the undergraduate experience, but the true message of the original book, Colleges That Change Lives, was to try to de-stress the entire college admission process. And um, the, the average national acceptance rate for colleges and universities is 67%. So more, more, most schools across the country are admitting more than half their applicants. The schools that you're hearing in the news, in the headlines, in the cocktail conversations are not those schools. But the majority of schools in the US actually admit more than half of their applicants. And so um, Susan's right, this is about fit and really expanding your mind, expand, keeping an open mind through your entire college search and focusing on where are you going to be most successful and where are you going to be happy? If this pandemic has taught us nothing else, this is the time for you to figure out what, what are the positive things that you want to really move forward um, and be excited about for the next four years um, and leave the rest of that behind. One last thing I'll add to that is, um, and I have to have these conversations with students and families every spring, but it's more, and you know, once they get over the disappointment, it's more about making the most of that opportunity at that particular institution that you're gonna choose. Nothing will dictate whether you're gonna be successful or not successful based on what college or university you choose to go to or admits you, but it's ultimately how you're gonna make the most of the opportunities given to you at whatever institution you choose to go to. Yeah, I would agree with everything said. And just to sort of bring it back to something that we highlighted a little bit earlier in the program is again, remember those institutional priorities. Remember that they change. It's not the same every year. And I, I forget which one of us, you know, said this, but chances are you're not going to know what those priorities are. So if you're student gets a decision back, you know, that they're unhappy with, um, please don't let that decision define you because, or your student, because again, there are so many thousands of amazing colleges and universities out there that are going to be a wonderful home for your student. Well, good. I think that covers it, right? Yes, um, yes we are recording this for those of you who came late and are now anxious to see what all the chatter is about. But um, I, I think we've just had an excellent discussion here for uh, the last hour and a half. And I think it's time to let these ladies go home. Um, thank you so much. It was just really very interesting, all the points of conversation. And you've helped us in how we're going to um, move forward with all of our, our um, families here. So thank you again. I'm going to stop this and uh, talk to everybody at another time. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you. Right. Thank Have you. Have fun. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thank you.